have the privilege of discussing the interpersonal violence. Interpersonal violence, including domestic violence and childhood physical and sexual abuse, is unfortunately a common problem in our society. It is estimated that 6% from between 6% and up to 15% of women have experienced domestic violence in the past 12 months with a lifetime prevalence estimated at 28% up to 54%. Likewise, childhood physical and sexual abuse prevalence rates will range from 3% to 40%. Interpersonal violence is associated with numerous long-term health effects, both physical and mental, and increased use of healthcare services. Interpersonal violence occurs across age, ethnic, gender and economic lines among persons with disabilities and among heterosexual as well as same-sex couples. The purpose of this concept analysis is to introduce you to the concept, including how to recognize it and the role of the nurse as related to interpersonal violence. Please take a moment and review the goals for this concept. The objectives um, for this chapter is to be able to define and describe interpersonal violence, to recognize the risk factors for interpersonal violence, and to be able to recognize the victim of this type of violence. Also, you should be able to give nursing and collaborative intervention in order to minimize the impact of this phenomenon. We'll start by giving a little bit of background and definitions for the concepts that we'll discuss today. So interpersonal violence is a cause of suffering and trauma which has devastating effects on the victim. As it is defined by the World Health Organization, violence is the intentional use of physical force or power, threatened or actual, against oneself, another person, or against a group or community that either results in or has a high likelihood of resulting in injury, death, psychological harm, maldevelopment, or deprivation. Furthermore, World Health Organization have categorized violence into three subtypes, self-directed violence, collective violence, and interpersonal violence. When we discuss interpersonal violence, we refer to the violence between individuals, and this is the focus of this lecture. When considering interpersonal violence, one must also consider the nature of the violence, the environment in which the violence occurs, the relationship between the perpetrator and the recipient of the violence, and possibly the motivation of the violence. In order to fully understand this concept, one must not restrict themselves to the recipient of the violence, but to consider the perpetrator as well. They too are part of the public health problem. And there are many categories of interpersonal violence uh, that can follow and can happen throughout the lifespan. And they may include child abuse and neglect, bullying, youth violence, intimate partner violence, and elderly abuse and neglect. We'll discuss now different categories of interpersonal violence and, and we'll look into special categories of, uh, that are at an increased um, risk. And we'll need to answer first the question, which children are at greater risk for abuse and neglect? Well, it is difficult to know exactly the actual figures of child maltreatment. Um, much of this will be unreported. In 2008, the national rate of reports of child maltreatment were 10.3 per 1,000 children. Child Protective Services screened 63% of those reported and 772,000 children were confirmed as victims. U.S. Department of Health and Human Services reported that 71% of these children experienced neglect 16% were physically abused, 9% were sexually abused, and 12% experienced other forms of abuse. Within the same report, it was stated that there were more reports of maltreatment for boys versus girls, 51% versus 
and the ages most affected were from birth to one year, with the rate decreasing with increasing age, and it kind of makes sense. Most maltreated children were white, 45%, and 56% of the perpetrator. That's a very interesting um, element. The most 55, 56% of the perpetrator were women. Um, let's look into another category. Let's look into bullying. And um, let's see, try and answer the question, when do bullying behaviors peak? And um, by now we know that most bullying occurs during childhood and adolescent years with a peak among uh, middle school children in most cases. Bullying occurs while at school, but this can also occur outside the school ground, such as on the way to and from school or during all kinds of extracurricular, extramural youth activities. Let's try and answer a different question. What contributes to youth violence? Multiple studies have shown children exposed to violence um, that those children are more likely to become violent as adults. Um, the factors that are influencing the likelihood of violence are a low level of intelligence, a low level of achievement, poor parental supervision, a harsh physical punishment as, uh, as a child, large number of siblings, low socioeconomic status, income inequality, racism, or the presence of gangs, guns, and drugs in the environment. According to CDC Center for uh, Disease Control and Prevention, youth violence is the second leading cause of death among young people between ages 10 and 24. A question related to intimate partner violence will be what contributes to intimate partner violence. Um, and factors that have been identified as risk factors for a man abusing his intimate partner include young age, heavy alcohol use, depression, personality disorders, low economic, um, low income, low academic achievement, and witnessing or experiencing violence as a child. There is another category in terms of um, ages, and that will be our elderly. And we'll look into who is most at risk for elder abuse we'll see that the reduced functional capacity places the elder at risk for maltreatment. Ageism is the stigmatization of older people and is likely an element of the etiology of elder abuse. Negative attitudes towards aging and the glorification of youth may contribute to elder abuse. Child abuse and neglect encompasses a wide variety of forms of child maltreatment, including physical abuse and sexual um, and um, neglect um, the Federal Child Abuse Prevention and um, Treatment Act defined child abuse and neglect as occurring when there is any recent act or failure to act on the part of the parent or care caretaker that results in death, serious physical or emotional harm, sexual abuse or exploitation, or when there is any act or failure to act that presents an imminent risk of serious harm. Bullying, by all means, is a form of abuse. It consists of intimidation or domination toward an individual who is perceived by the perpetrator as weak. Youth violence, on the other hand, refers to the harmful behavior, um, such as slapping or hitting or any other form of physical assault with or without weapon that can start early and continue into young adulthood. The intimate partner violence refers to any behavior within an intimate relationship that may result in physical, psychological, or sexual harm, such as physical aggression, psychological abuse, which could include intimidation and humiliation, forced sexual coercion, and other behaviors designed to control the recipient of the violence. Elder abuse refers to abuse to an older person by the other by the per, the other person in the family uh, or by a caregiver. The abuse can consist of omission or commission, and it can be physical, psychological, sexual, financial, 
or any other form of maltreatment such as neglect. Sexual violence, on the other hand, is defined by the World Health Organization as any sexual act, attempt to obtain a sexual act that is unwanted. And when we are looking at the physical consequences, um, the physical injury is highly dependent on the physical nature of the trauma that the victim is experiencing. So what will be some common physical injuries? Um, there are common patterns that have been identified in the literature and they were uh, researched. Primarily, the patients will complain of headaches, back pain, a choking sensation. They will come with hyperventilation or gastrointestinal symptoms. They may complain of chest pain. They may have facial fractures um, and other head and neck injuries. It had been reported that 83% of the fractures experienced by victims of assault will involve the face and 69% of patients with violence-related injuries have involvement of the craniofacial region. So most of the cases of interpersonal violence will have some kind of lesion at the level of the head, neck, or face. There are other studies that look at this from the other uh, point of view, from the other angle, and they found out that the dominant cause of facial fractures in North America is interpersonal violence. Sexual violence can occur in the context of child abuse and or intimate partner violence, or it can occur as an isolated incident. The health consequences depend on the age of the victim, the relationship uh, between the victim and the perpetrator, the circumstances of the environment, and the severity and or types of other violence that may accompany the incident. So what will be some signs and symptoms associated with sexual trauma? Again, they all depend on the elements described before. However, the health um, consequences uh, may include unintended pregnancy and gynecologic complications such as bleeding, infection, pain during intercourse, chronic pelvic pain, sexual transmitted diseases, human efficiency virus transmission, and urinary tract infections. They are all associated with sexual violence. There are some consequences of violence during pregnancy also. Um, the violence that occurs during pregnancy can have detrimental effects not only on the mother, but also on the fetus. In the United States, um, there are there is an estimation of abuse that the abuse during pregnancy may range from 3% to, in some cases, in some areas, to third, in some communities, up to 38%. And there is an increased risk of miscarriage, stillbirth, uh, premature labor and delivery, fetal injury, and low birth weight. There is also associated with that an increased risk of maternal mortality. We are looking now, we are continuing to look into the consequences of interpersonal um, um, violence, and we are exploring now the mental health consequences. Uh, Post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, is one of the most common mental health consequences of exposure to interpersonal violence. The incidence of PTSD um, varies um, into though, among those exposed to interpersonal violence uh, varies by study from 33% to up to almost 90%. The nature of the violence is predictive of the severity of the symptoms of PTSD. For instance, the, with, the use of a weapon and sexual abuse result in more severe symptoms. The characteristic symptoms of PTSD are threefold, um, and they may include re-experiencing, including intrusive and recurrent thoughts, images, and flashbacks of the violence. Avoidance and numbing include feeling of detachment and persistent avoidance of memories that relate to the violence. And they will include an increased arousal um, that will manifest itself by insomnia, difficulty focusing, and hypervigilance. Also, depression is a common reaction to interpersonal uh, violence. Um, there will be some consequences on infants and children. The physical uh, sequelae of childhood abuse are determined by the type of violence done to the child. Uh, however, in some cases, the social and emotional consequences seem most severe. A history of childhood uh, maltreatment often results in childhood delinquency and adult criminality. Most 
50% of the maltreated children will have been arrested for a non-traffic offense during their adulthood. Children who experience sexual abuse have high rates of PTSD, up to a third of them. Other common consequences of childhood sexual abuse are developmentally inappropriate sexual behavior, such as age-inappropriate knowledge, sexual preoccupation, and excessive masturbation. The health consequences of childhood abuse have been identified by researchers um, and seem to be related to specific behavioral risk factors such as smoking, alcohol abuse, poor diet, and lack of exercise. Some of the major adult forms of illness um, include ischemic heart disease, cancer, chronic lung disease, irritable bowel syndrome, and fibromyalgia. There are some risk factors associated um, with interpersonal violence. Um, so interpersonal violence will involve all age groups and all races and ethnicities. It is not restricted to any one special interest group or any socioeconomic group, and it, it can involve all genders. A common factor in most um, examples of interpersonal violence involves the use or the misuse, uh, more correctly saying, of alcohol. Alcohol has been reported to be a risk factor in intimate partner violence child abuse, youth violence, and elder abuse. From the beginning of colonization of the Americas, there has been a stratified caste system based on race, ethnicity, religion, and sexuality. Europeans were privileged over non-Europeans, and men were privileged over women. Therefore, the patriarchy was racialized. At an interpersonal and intrafamilial level, power leads to a culture that breeds violence. Studies have suggested that migration, aculturalization, underemployment, undereducation, and economic stress contribute to domestic violence. On the other hand, the high socioeconomic status has generally been considered to be protective against interpersonal violence. However, it is not necessarily. Generally, women living in poverty have been disproportionately affected. Now, what do we need to do in order to uh, be able to assess um, an interpersonal violence victim? First, we'll need to be able to recognize the phenomenon. And perpetrator may provide a history of events that are in the events that are incomplete or inconsistent with the injury seen. Many individuals who experience interpersonal violence are unable or afraid to provide an accurate account of events. So be on the alert for the perpetrators who answer all questions for the victim and never leave her alone. We are continuing with the assessment now, and, and there are certain elements in the medical history that should raise concern for physical abuse. This should raise red flags to healthcare workers and should be investigated more deeply. Specific examples include a history of trauma that is inconsistent or implausible with a physical examination, a history of no trauma with evidence of injury, a history of self-inflicted trauma that is developmentally unlikely, and serious injuries blamed on siblings or playmates. The nurse should also maintain a high degree of awareness for injuries that are not typically seen in the context of day-to-day -day living, such as unusual patterns of bruising or burn marks. Traumatic brain injuries uh, usually occur in infants less than one year of age. Um, we'll see in the form of the shaken baby syndrome, a very common in infants. And studies have shown that um, 15% to 25% of these injuries um, are fatal, and almost 90% of the survivors, survivors are left with um, different degrees of compromise, including learning disabilities, blindness, seizures, and paralysis. So the consequences are can be catastrophic if not fatal. Abdominal injuries uh, caused by punching or kicking, uh, which lead to internal bleeding, are the second most cause, common cause of death, especially in child abuse. Burns are a common injury associated with abuse. In fact, it is believed that 10% of all physical abuse cases involve some type of burns, and um, 
it's not unusually to see scalding water uh, as a cause for the burn. Burns with um, a stalking pattern or circular burn marks uh, always should raise suspicion and serious injuries blamed on siblings or playmates should also um, be investigated. Another example of an injury that should be investigated um, in, in depth is a femur fracture in an infant. In terms of clinical management, we are looking at different types of prevention. And the level of the primary prevention, um, it, this should be a key public health priority. Uh, education of communities and social awareness of the problem help prevention. And we need to understand that um, by education, we are able to reduce the rate of, uh, rate of violence throughout the lifespan and also to reduce the various forms of violence. In terms of secondary prevention, or what is called the screening, a large number of screening tools have been developed to screen for the various types of interpersonal violence, um, and those can be used in a number of healthcare settings. Nurses should be aware of a, the appropriate tool to be used depending on the setting, such as in, in an emergency department, school-based clinics, inpatient settings, or community-based clinics. Um, there are two examples of resources uh, for screening tools. Uh, one is the intimate partner violence, and the other one is the uh, sexual violence victimization assessment instrument uh, that can be used in healthcare settings. We'll discuss now the collaborative interventions um, that uh, are available and should be used um, when we are discussing interpersonal violence. When interpersonal violence is suspected or identified, the priority intervention is to protect the infant, child, adult, or elder from any further abuse. And it is the legal and ethical duty of nurses and all health professionals to report any suspected abuse. All states have laws for mandatory reporting of child abuse and other forms of violence. Emotional support and appropriate referrals are also needed for the patient and family. There should be a focus on minimizing the psychological consequences, um, and, and that's essential, particularly helping those who have suffered emotionally uh, to experience and establish some positive relationship in the future. Education and counseling are offered um, and they are needed to ensure adequate coping strategies. Nurses can also help patients and families gain access to appropriate community agencies and support groups as available. Many of the Sequoia of the interpersonal violence results um, in either um, in other health and illness concepts. For instance, for instance, uh, it could um, interpersonal violence could conceivably involve almost all health and illness concepts depending upon the physical and psychological effect of the violence. In fact, um, those sequelae are cumulative and long-lasting beyond the violence event. The common psychological consequences of interpersonal violence include anxiety and stress, uh, mood and effect um, changes, Individuals who experience interpersonal violence rely on coping strategies as part of their response to such events. Question one. What is the term for abuse that consists of intimidation or domination toward an individual who is perceived as weak? The options are one, child neglect, two, bullying, three, youth violence, or for elder abuse? The correct answer is two. Bullying is a form of abuse. Bullying tactics can be physical, verbal, or emotional, often through social and cyberbullying approaches. What type model can be used to understand the multifaceted dimension of violence? One, ecological. Two, economic. Three, socioeconomic, or four, psychological. The correct answer is one. This model explores the relationship among the individuals 
and contextual factors as well as the multiple layers of risk factors associated with violence. In what country is the social-cultural view of the etiology of intimate partner violence rooted in the family and society in the form of a historical legacy of oppression and colonization? The options are one, Asia, two, Africa, three, Europe, or four, North America. Correct answer is for North America. From the beginning of the colonization of the Americas, there has been a stratified caste system based on race, ethnicity, religion, and sexuality. 